All right, well, we have a little bit of time just to ask some questions. I'm going to start with you, Conrad. You shared with us earlier the joy and pleasure of church planting churches. And that was a blessing from Philippians. Thank you for that. I wanted to ask you maybe to just a couple, give a couple testimonies of what that looks like now. I mean, where do you see that being borne out in your own ministry? Uh, where do you see churches being planted as a result of your emphasis on this the last few years? Yeah, um, thank you very much. Uh, those of you who are here this morning will have picked it up that uh, what I was sharing was uh, not just an exposition of scripture, but something that is a testimony, uh, the pleasure of uh, planting uh, a church, planting church. And uh, in terms of uh, one or two um, areas of, of testimony, with respect to um, where we are at and uh, where that seems to be going. Um, there was a time that we were burdened about uh, planting churches in the, the major cities, uh, what we would call provincial capitals in Zambia. And uh, we, we, by the grace of God, we helped to see those cities having at least one uh, Reformed Baptist church planted there. And then uh, while that was still going on, uh, we've had a growing desire to see um, in other countries, English-speaking countries within Africa, uh, to see at least one good, solid church established there. Some of the countries already do have uh, such churches Others don't, and we have deliberately uh, been focusing our attention on, on those countries in the context of, of Africa, and therefore we've, we've seen a number of uh, such churches being planted. And now, generally speaking, our hearts seem to be moving towards what some of you will know as the 1040 window, uh, the part of our world where we have uh, the least evangelized uh, peoples. Um, how the Lord will finally do that, we don't know, but uh, our, our last missions conference was specifically for that, um, so that we can learn as God's people and see how he will open doors for us. And I must say that the speaker who came really helped us to, to see what we were just never aware of in terms of the open door that is there for us as the people of Africa to, uh, to take the gospel there. So that's what's happening. And uh, while we are reaching there, the, the other areas we began with, we're still co continuing with uh, uh, church planting efforts. So we, we are encouraged by the fact that the Lord himself is the one who's calling individuals to uh, take his gospel uh, further afield. We simply provide for that and encourage the church to be very supportive in this work. Thank you. Tremendous. Thank you. Paul, it's good to have you with us. Thanks for joining us today. I want to build on what Conrad has alluded to. I, I know a real desire on HeartCry's part is to reach into the 1040 window. Maybe comment on that, but specifically, what's the necessity to train nationals and indigenous leaders to be missionaries into the 1040 window? Well, um, we always hear about differing methodologies for missions and strategies, and it seems like there's a new one every week, and then it's pushed out by the, the one that comes after it. Um, to put it simply, that, that is the only strategy. That's the biblical strategy. So if we have indigenous churches, and we do, that are biblical and mature, they will be practicing um, 2 Timothy 2.2. They will be training up men and trusting uh, the word of God to them to go out. And then they will, um, those men who are elder qualified will either stay and pastor in that church or they'll be sent out to plant another church in an existing neighborhood nearby or around the world. So it's, it's always um, training. 
And, and one of the things that's very important that I always want to point out is, for example, the Korwai tribe, uh, 15, 20 years ago, they were cannibals and in Papua, Indonesia. And so the, the idea sometimes in missions is that if we can just get them to understand a little bit of the gospel and pray a prayer and ask Jesus into their heart and they're saved, wonderful. See, I, be, I believe that that is very, very wrong. I believe that, that those cannibals in a couple of generations sitting under the preaching of God's word can become a light to the nations uh, spiritually, academically, culturally, everywhere. I believe the gospel has the power to transform. And we're seeing that as the West erodes. We're seeing men like in Africa and different places that it's not just that they're learning the scripture, but they're learning the scripture and it's impacting every aspect of life and culture. As we look at what's happening in the world and just, uh, frankly, uh, increasing restrictions for travel, whether it be during COVID, but more broadly than that, just hostility towards the West and the limiting open doors for folks like maybe Americans to go into those situations. Maybe the, both of you can comment on the importance, both of the opportunity, but the importance in, in, at this point in history for a missionary force to be encouraged from countries other than the U.S. or just uh, North America? Well, uh, I think from my end, the way that I would put it is that w when I read the Bible, it, it does not excuse me from participating in the Great Commission. And therefore, even if the door did not close for Americans, I would still be obligated to convince my church mm -hmm. that let's do what God wants us to do. I think the doors closing on a number of countries like the US that have been a major contributor to missions simply makes that obligation higher. But otherwise, I still think that uh, the, the church where I'm coming from should purposefully be involved in, in the work of mission, even if doors end up opening wider for the American church. We must have the whole church going to the whole world. This book puts that obligation on me. And if I, I divide the work of missions, borrowing from William Carey, and it's very simple. And I said this Sunday night, you're either called to go down into the well or to hold the rope for those who go down. Either way, there's gonna be scars on your hands. And um, you know, I'm sitting up here with my brother Conrad who I've known for, for many, many years. And um, I, honestly, my whole life, a uh, big part of heart cry has just been holding the rope uh, for the men in Zambia that then, I like to use the term, bled over, because it is with blood, <laughs> bled over into so many other nations. And you see, um, there are theologian pastors in Africa, men who, can, who know more of Scripture than I do, who can preach uh, more powerfully than I can, um, so what I do is, as I look in my hand, what do I have in my hand that my brothers who are better qualified in other ways do not have in their hand? And what can I put of mine in their hand so that they can go on with the ministry? And I think all of us need to look at that, to look at that. But we need to look at it globally. It's not, a, it's not the case where you've got, um, how can I say it? Little people just running around believing in Jesus around the world. God is raising up men of God, women of God with great integrity that uh, they can go on. They can go on beyond us, but they still need our help. Conrad, earlier you alluded to and I'd like you both to comment on the importance of training pastors to recognize 
the responsibility of missions in their own churches. Talk about what we need to do in the context of training to accomplish that end. Yes. Um, now, in, in providing a bit of uh, criticism to theological trainers and pastoral trainers, please bear in mind that I'm one of you. I train pastors, so I'm, I'm, I'm not just throwing stones at other people. Um, but what I tend to see is that the, the emphasis um, with training pastors is, yes, let's teach them church history, let's teach them systematic theology, let's teach them um, biblical studies, hermeneutics, homiletics, and so on. Let's teach them all these things. And yes, let's squeeze in missions as well. Uh, but what's really happening in the process in their minds is often, let me pass this so that I can finish and go. And they get to the end, and what they're still thinking is this, that if now I can have an opportunity to either plant or, or pass a church, I've arrived. And I think that's the mold that needs to be broken while they are still in training. That they need to see that they are part of the unfolding drama of redemption. And that their role is not simply to then end up with a good church with many people and a budget that runs millions, but it is to see them replicate themselves elsewhere in more needy areas, and that that's not an optional extra. It is part of the actual command of our Lord. Um, how your Bible colleges and seminaries will do that, I mean, obviously you would have to think through that process. But there, there definitely has to be a deliberate, intentional way to bring individuals to the graduation podium in whom this is a burning reality. And they, they want to get out there to see it done. Um, I mean, our Lord did leave his disciples behind, and the marching orders to them was what we've now come to call the Great Commission. We read the book of Acts, and that's exactly what they went on to do. You didn't have 12 guys who were now happy that they've got their churches, happy clappy until they go to heaven. They took the world by storm because it had to be done. So that's all I'll say. Thank you. Just to add to that the, the idea of a wartime mentality. Uh, men live differently during war than they do at peace. We are in a war. Um, I expect it to, to make me old much quicker. I expect it to kill me. We are at war. Um, we, we live in a time now where ethnicity is, different ethnicities are binding people to, you know, to their ethnicity and separating them from others and things like that. And um, I have an ethnicity, I have a tribe, I have a people. It's everyone who calls upon the name of the Lord. I have fathers and mothers, sisters and brothers, sons and daughters who go without spiritual knowledge, who go without physical well-being, who are imprisoned, who are enslaved, who are suffering from that great dragon because they do not have the theological wherewithal to stand against them, and my life does not matter. And I would give a call to you men. We, we don't matter. What matters are our people all over the world. 
And if you're not called to go, then you're called to support, to help those who who do go. We are servants of God's servants, of God's people. And it gives a man a reason to live. If you're a man, you were born to fight. I'm sorry, that's what you were born for. Well, this is a fight in which I hope one day that we'll fall across the threshold, bloody and beaten, and they'll pry our sword and our shield out of our hand and hang it in that great hall. That's why we live. And that's what we need to hear, is that perspective, certainly. Maybe just to add to our thinking on this, if we look at what typically occurs in the context of seminary education, at least in North America, we've been able to become specialist. So if you look at most degree programs uh, that are offered in theological training institutions, you can get a whole master's in missions or you know, a doctorate in missions, and, and somehow it's those guys who specialize in missions and then those who are called to serve the local church. So there are some things I think we've done structurally that reinforce that in the life of, of pastors through their formal training. But the reality of what you men are committed to where they're mentored in the context of a local church and they're given a heart for ministry and the gospel, maybe speak about the importance of giving them hands-on ministry experience, including evangelism and outreach. Okay. Well, with me, if, if I were to start a seminary, I wouldn't even have a missions program. I would have an ecclesiology program because missions is basically one biblical church with biblical elders training up Uh, elder qualified men and sending them out to start another church. And I am so tired to the point of anger of hearing, it it seems that the world of missions wants to create this culturally elite, esoteric missionary knowledge that somehow the Bible-thumping little pastor back home can't understand all the cultural nuances of doing missions. And and it's a lie. How do you plant a church in the strangest and most foreign land? The same way you plant one at home. You go out and do the work of an evangelist. You pastor God's people. And and, and missions is not, it doesn't require this nuanced study. It requires pastor theologians, evangelist theologians, teacher theologians. That's what it requires that go out and do the work of church planting. Thank you. Something we don't talk a lot about, maybe enough about, is a church that is committed, a mature church that's committed to be a sending church, involved in church planting, evangelism locally, cross-culturally, internationally. How has that church benefited and blessed What happens to that congregation when their eyes are lifted up and directed out to the needs of the lost? And more than that, just, you know, the the annual mission sermon that every pastor obligatorily preaches or the annual missions conference, a church that really is committed to being a participant in the outworking of God's redemptive plan. What happens to that congregation by way of blessing? You mentioned earlier just the joy of that. But how does it benefit the congregation? Yes, um, um, as I was saying at the beginning of my message today, that uh, the, the title, the pleasure of uh, planting, uh, a church planting church, um, that that was really uh, a testimony. And it's, it's genuine joy that uh, one has when you see the fruit within the, the, the hands or the life of the congregation. Um, there is a cost, no doubt, to the work of missions. But ask anybody who has served the Lord faithfully, whether it's a sender or a giver, and you'll find that there are 
full of joy, with a real sense of fulfillment because of what uh, the Lord is doing. With respect to the congregation, one of the things that I've noticed is the, uh, the sense of genuine fulfillment that this book is, is alive. That, uh, for instance, that the book of Acts is real. That we're not just reading history about individuals who did something, but that actually we are living out that history. That today we are seeing these men and their families being sent out, churches being established where there were once none, the light of Christ beginning to be uh, emanating from there. And as they are getting these uh, reports coming back, the, the, their own Bibles come alive. Now, surely, that's something worth living for. But also, it's, it's the, the sense of unity. You know, when a church is not outward looking, you literally kill one another over the color of the curtains in the church. <laughs> the pews. <laughs> what the color of the cushions should be. And the carpet. And that's it. You are fighting over nothing. But when the church is outward looking and is spending and being spent for the extension of God's kingdom, it's amazing the level of unity that we have in the church. In fact, what sometimes happens is that someone joins your church who's come from a, a background of these same silly squabbles. And then in a member's meeting, he, he tries to kick up some tantrums. And you find everybody sort of just looking, wondering, where has he come from? That's <laughs> such a small thing, you can sort it outside. Let, let's continue this meeting. <laughs> so the, the whole atmosphere of the church becomes healthy because you are walking in the will of the Lord. And then, as I also said, the, the fulfillment in not just sending out your, your best sons, your best families, but also the fulfillment of continuing to support them. That sense of we are doing something for the glory of God, for the extension of God's kingdom. So yes, there are costs, there's no doubt about it, but the church itself really gets blessed. There are blessings that come your way. Thank you. That was wonderful. <laughs> <laughs> Might we say that some of the struggles the church has are a result of it just being so inward focus that the absence of a mission's vision mm -hmm. or an outward looking vision is part of the problem uh, and even part of the solution. Because it doesn't it create the greater context and demand for the church to be sanctified, to be holy because of its gospel witness. And when that isn't present, we become in, in one sense, even consumers of our own sanctification. Well, the, the Spirit of God is the Spirit of missions. And he's, he's sending. Um, his, his, the Spirit's purpose is to glorify the Son, to gather a people for the Son. And I can't think of any way, hardly, that would grieve the Spirit more than to seek to truncate that, to, to bring an end to that, or not be concerned about it. And so, um, you know, I, I always get this question, you know, why, um, why do we see the Spirit of God do so much in the book of Acts? Well, in, in some ways, the Spirit of God is, um, it, it's almost like an, um, 
according to the economy. And, and what I mean by that is um, he doesn't just do things for doing things sake. And so when a people go out and step out and risk, whether it's risking their own life preaching or whether it's risking themselves financially or maybe a, a church that decides we really don't need new carpet, we should build an institute somewhere in the world or something. When they do that, it, it is, it's, it's like the Spirit of God is working. And, and the more that we get involved with what He's doing, the more we're going to see His power. And, and, and that's a great problem. But l- let me say this, that one of the reasons why not many should be teachers, and one of the reasons why it is very uh, a, a terrible thing to some degree to lay hands on a man, to ordain them, and, and to be ordained, is in many ways that church is going to become a reflection of those pastors. And pastors, we've got, to, we've got to stand against fear that causes self-preservation. And we've got to risk. We've got to risk ourselves. Um, you see a church that is heartily involved in missions, it's because you're going to see the pastors that are leading them believe in missions. And um, again, it, it's, it's all privilege. We're, we've been so privileged that we must go out and we must do this. Building on that, can we just speak practically? How can a pastor and, and elders in a church model a personal commitment to missions in addition to their preaching ministry and teaching ministry? Uh, maybe how do you try to do that or how do you see men doing that effectively? Yeah, well, I'm, I'm in a pastoral context, and that's uh, something that, um, first of all, one does uh, unintentionally because all you are doing is loving God the best way you know how and loving others. You're basically fulfilling the, the greatest and second greatest commandment. And as you are doing that, inevitably the whole area of missions becomes part of what you are seeking to do. And um, the, for those of us who are pastors, we, we have the privilege of being in the pulpit. We have the privilege of often praying um, on, before the congregation. And th- they can discern, even through your prayers, where your actual heart is. And that's one area. Again, remember, I'm not saying begin with the prayers. I'm saying begin with love. Okay. And then it works its way uh, through, through your praying. Your, your concern for the, the unreached peoples as you are praying and, and so forth in the life of the congregation, in the prayer meetings and, and so forth. It's also... The, when you have individuals who are missionaries and they are passing through your church, your town, not simply acknowledging that they are there, but giving them a few minutes to share what's going on in the mission field and to pray for them. Again, your, your people descend, they, they pick it up that this is where you are at as a a pastor. And then also seeking to meet those people in a practical way. To borrow the words of Paul right into the Romans saying, on my way to Spain, I'll pass through that you may help me um, on my way there. That that reality happening in the context of your own church. The, the, your, your people begin to see that you, you genuinely have a heart for the work of missions because you are seeking to, to put together whatever resources you can from the church in order to go into the realm of missions. May I also throw in a quick one, and it is where you can to go to such places in order for you to go and help out whichever way you can and go with some church members. L- let them see your heart there, out there in the field. 
Uh, again, it's not because you want to do that to, to be some kind of model. It's your heart. It's love that is overflowing in that way. So there are a number of these areas, but ultimately the question is, is your heart in love with the Lord and his work and also in love with a very needy world? Thank you. The, um, I, I used to come back from the mission field and sometimes I would you know, be sort of upset when I would go into a church and it seemed like the pastor wasn't gung-ho for missions. And, but as I, as I grew in the faith, um, I began to respect that. Um, missions can be exciting. Church planting can be exciting. The true test of a pastor is that he loves his people. And when we talk about being excited about missions and moving, you know, your church to missions, it's never to the neglect of the, the highest calling of pastoring, a pastor who simply loves his people. So when we talk about getting excited about missions, we're not talking about neglecting uh, those who time and time again need your help. But um, when I was in Peru, there was a missionary there. His name was Carlton Allen. And he'd say it this way, independent fundamentalist Baptist. And he was one of the finest men in much of what I know today. And, and his kindness, his love for the people. And after he came off the field, uh, I, I, I visited his church a couple times. It was just a, a small church in the south. And uh, they gave hundreds of thousands of dollars to missions. They, they did. And, and no one was rich there. And I, I would, he just, he cared so much for the world. And those things are not taught as much as they're caught. And I asked him, I said, Carlton, How? You know, many of the, most of the people in your church have never, you know, been out of the state. And he goes, son, I just, I put missions before them. And, and he took me into the church there where they had the Sunday school classes. You could hardly walk five feet down that hallway without looking up and seeing a framed picture of a missionary, a missionary, a missionary. So he was always putting it before the people about winning souls both, both at home and abroad. And I saw something there. I work in missions. I, I'm, I'm not a pastor. I, I don't even preach that much. I, I spend almost all my time uh, working every day in dealing with missionary problems and, and things. And um, I find it that my heart can grow dull. And yet 10 hours a day, all I do is missions. And I go to bed at night, I'm thinking about missions. I can't sleep, I'm thinking about missions. So if sometimes my heart grows dull and I'm in this activity all the time, then how much more people of God who are in the church, who, who love Christ more than I do, but missions is never presented before them. We should expect them to, in a sense, have a dull heart and an unclear mind about the Great Commission. So it is the duty of the pastor to present it before them and not in a whipping post sort of way, not at all, but as a privilege, as a privilege. Look what we can do. You know, I hear so many churches, you know, we're just in this little farm community in the Midwest, but, but look what we could do by, by helping these, these brothers in, in the Philippines or, or Africa or, or Paris. And, and it's when you get involved in missions and another thing, when you get involved in generosity, it's Christmas every day. There's a sense in which it's Christmas every day. Just to comment on uh, what you were saying there, in our enthusiasm and excitement about missions, we may unintentionally make our people feel guilty or try to motivate them simply out of duty. Yeah. You're saying, the motive is the love of Christ for us and yeah. for them. And so I just wanted to punctuate yeah. that. But uh, la one last question. A lot of folks may be here. Uh, we have a lot of great pastors committed to missions. That's why they're here today, and we're thankful for that. But there might be some folks here who are in a church, and their pas a pastor doesn't have a passion for missions. 
And there's a lot of faithful lay people who do and somehow kind of feel marginalized or neglected or uh, maybe even put upon to carry the ball for missions. What would you say to those faithful lay people? How can they best encourage and help their pastor have a heart for missions? Well, it won't be through coercion or manipulation. It, it's primarily through prayer. Uh, I always go back to what do you have that you have not received, and if you have received it, why do you boast? It's, it's a grace. Any virtue is a grace. Any particular avenue of love that one goes down is a grace. And so pray um, and, and talk, but talk to him. Pray for him. Help him see. Um, one of the greatest things that I think a church can do for their pastor you see, people talk about mission trips all the time, and uh, most of them are, to be honest with you, a waste of time and money. Um, but what we really need is for churches to send their pastor, and may, if he is an expositor, if he's a faithful pastor, theologian, expositor, there's so many places in the world where he could go and, and be with 25 men that he could pour his literally that would be sitting on the edge of their seat to listen to his teaching. Send him to places like that. Allow him to go twice a year, once a year. Allow a few of the, the laymen or deacons or whatever to go with him, and, and he will catch the vision. There's the one other thing, if you permit me, that I would like to say, and this is very important. So when I'm with a whole bunch of young church planters that are just wanting to go to the field, I always ask them, what is your plan? And it's, if they're biblical, it'll be, well, I want to plant a biblical church, and from that church, plant another church. You know, start planting churches. And I always, for the shock value, go wrong. And I remember I had a discussion with Dr. MacArthur about this about two years ago. I tell them, I said, son, you plant a church because you love those people in the church, and Dr. MacArthur said, and you want to feed them. Be very, very careful of ever using the church to carry out some vision you have, even if it's a biblical one. Because here's what's going to happen. You're going to plant that church, and you know what? They're not going to cooperate with your vision. They're going to hold you back. Because when you're wanting to look at that next hill and plant that church, you're going to have to go back and fix this same marriage over and over. You're going to have to pull this man possibly out of, of, of some sin. You're going to have to go over here and end a squabble between two sisters. And you're going, no, I want to conquer the world. And in time, what's going to happen is you're going to despise the very people for whom the church was planted. And so you plant a church because you love that church and you want to pour your life into that church. But if you are a pastor who loves the people and pours himself into the people, eventually you will plant churches. I think that's very important. Any last comments? Well, uh, to simply add, especially the, on that note of send your pastor, I'm coming from Africa, and I know that doctrinally, we are a very needy continent. You people are blessed beyond measure. You just don't know it. Mm -hmm. you, you have the books, you, you have the training. So yes, do send us your pastors to meet with five, 10, yeah. 20 individuals with some books, make their way through, and leave the people richer doctrinally. Yes. Because as I said at the beginning this morning, it won't be long before Africa is sending out missionaries and praying. But I'm also praying that those missionaries will be doctrinally sound. Yes. And there, we need you. We really do. Thank you very much. Well, thank you both. We're grateful for your ministry to us today. Lord bless you.